this is a 49 year old guy, a very interesting case. He's a, he's a smoker, hypertensive, otherwise relatively healthy. Uh, he was at a, a, a cherry picker. So they have these cranes that allow you to climb up and, and pick cherries off of trees and do uh, whatever agricultural things they need to do. He fell like 20 to 25 feet off of the crane onto the ground. And he ended up having a traumatic T12 burst fracture, and we ended up reconstructing him, as you can see on the procedure portion. But uh, just to let you know his, his story, he went home because his back hurt. He said, oh, my back hurts really bad. He took the rest of the day off, went home, took ibuprofen, woke up three hours later, said, hey, you know what? My back really hurts. Uh, calls his sister, who's a nurse, who happens to work in my hospital, and he ends up going to his local ER. They imaged it, they found something very bad, and the ER doctor called me frantically. But the interesting thing is, when he woke up three hours late, he drove himself to the hospital. And the reason I'm prefacing this is when you look at the image, you'll be shocked. This is his image. Not only did he have a traumatic T12 burst fracture, he has significant conus and cord compression here, as you can see in your left-sided image. But looking at his CAT scan, he, he had a modified chance fracture, fracture through the spinous process, it was through the pedicles, through the facets, and he's developed a kyphotic deformity at the level. I'm shocked that this guy was even walking. It, it really was, was pretty amazing. So looking at these images, what goes through in my mind is number one, he has significant neural compression. Even though he's, he's relatively neurologically intact, he has significant neural compression when it decompresses the neural elements. But if we just decompress the neural elements, and, and lock them in place and get the pressure off the cord, we're doing this guy a disservice because his global alignment is completely off. So in order to ensure the durability of the operation that we do, we needed to reconstruct it. So again, the question is how do you do this operation? All posterior, all anterior, or a combined anterior posterior? In order to get the fragments off the conus medullaris, in his case, doing an all anterior procedure is extremely difficult uh, because of just the amount of, of angulation into the sac itself. The risk of having a traumatic dural tear with persistent CSF leak and possibly CSF fistula is quite high. So when I looked at this case, I thought my primary goal is to make sure the neural elements are decompressed. So I determined that I would go posterior first and then come enter. So step one of the procedure, I do all these operations under neurological monitoring, particularly when there's cord compression or, or significant neural compression. And to digress a little bit, uh, neural monitoring is something I, I believe firmly in. So I am, have been lucky or unlucky enough, whichever way you want to look at it, to do a lot of very deformed cases and, and patients with significant neural compression. So whenever I'm doing an operation, I get a baseline study, and then I position them. And I have re changed positioning to probably about 15 to 20 percent of patients just based on neurophysiology alone. If I position the patient and there's any change in signals or any significant change in signals, I reposition the patient. If there's a stable change in signals, then I'll change my approach. I'll, if I'm going to go posterior, I'll switch it to anterior, I'll switch it to lateral. It all depends on what I see with the signaling. And again, in, in this particular case, I got my baseline signals. I went posteriorly, I decompressed, and then I instrumented, so I put in the screws above and below after doing a laminectomy over the affected area and then a bilateral transpedicular decompression. So I pushed all the bone away from the cones. So I got a nice circumferential, almost circ completely circumferential uh, neural decompression. But again, we're still dealing with the patient's deformity. So instead of taking the nerve roots, I said, I'm going to put this patient over to lateral, under nerve monitoring, repeat the signals, and then take a rib and do a retropleural dissection, do a corpectomy, put an expandable cage in to restore height, restore some of the, uh, the alignment, and then flip back over posteriorly and drop in the rods. And that's essentially what we did. And on this particular case, I did take a rib, and when I took the rib, I used that and I blended it up in a bone mill and used it with the osteoamp sponge. So our initial post-op scan does show some hyperdensity in it because that was from the rib, the mortalized rib graphite. 
So this is his post-operative scan. You can see that I pinned them the three above, three below, just due to the size and the amount of, uh, of fracture he had. And you see initial post-op scan. But again, this is a 16 month post-op CT scan. You can see clear hyperdensity, both from the a loss of the blurring of the end plate of L1, bone and hyperdensity growing throughout the cage up into T11. So not only was I able to allow this patient and restore his alignment, I was able to get this patient fused across a long segment. And I did use, uh, again, some of his, his actual retrieval body as well too because it was a corpectomy in a non-infected case.